life in the ocean and introduction to adaptations. So we know that an adaptation is a process whereby a population becomes better suited to its habitat. Um, it takes place over many generations and you increase uh, genetic variability through sexual reproduction over asexual reproduction because you pass on the genes from both the, the uh, sperm and the egg when they meet. And this helps the organism and populations to become better suited for their environment as, as populations evolve over time. So adapting, uh, one of the adaptations that marine organisms need to adapt to is salinity. And uh, from basic biology in 10th grade, you've learned about osmosis, which is the transport of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And the osmotic stress, and osmotic stress is sudden change in solute concentration around a cell causing the movement of water across its cell membrane. Um, under conditions of high salinity, water is drawn out of the cells through osmosis. So uh, we looked at that and you have learned of three osmotic states being hypertonic, that is when the cell would lose water causing the cell to shrivel. Um, isotonic is when the cell is in equilibrium conditions and there is no major net movement of water. And then you have the hypotonic where the cell has a higher solute concentration inside, so osmotic stress and osmotic pressure. Uh, is going to cause water to move from outside the cell into the cell and cause that cell to swell. Um, osmotic pressure is the pressure that must be applied to a solution to prevent the inward flow of water across that semipermeable membrane. So if you go back to basic biology, picture uh, what that uh, biological membrane looks like with those phospholipids and uh, you have those aquaporin channels that allow water to move quickly across the membrane uh, because Phospholipids are a fat. They uh, tend to have those hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. And here you can see uh, up here that that would be an isotonic state where cells, animal cells, have no net movement of water. Here the salt concentration would be greater outside the cell than inside the cell. So water is going to move from the cell where it is highly concentrated out and the cell will shrink and shrivel. And then here the salt concentration is greater inside the cell than outside the cell. So water where it's highly concentrated outside the cell is now going to move into the cell, causing the cell to swell and possibly burst. So what do uh, uh, marine organisms do? They deal with salinity through osmoregulation. And osmoregulation is the active regulation of osmotic pressure of an organism's fluids to maintain water content. It keeps the organism's fluid from becoming too dilute or too concentrated. And there are uh, different types of osmoregulations that can be seen within marine organisms. So an organism that is an osmoconformer will match their body osmolarity or their body's salinity to their environment. If you're an organism that is an osmoregulator, you're going to regulate uh, their body osmolarity by actively controlled salt concentrations despite salt concentrations within the environment. And here you could see examples of that in uh, uh, freshwater fish versus the marine. And you could see that the ions are red arrows, so th those would be salt ions, and then you see the blue arrows represent water. Um, you could see that you uh, in the both the marine and the freshwater fish uh, dilute urine uh, comes out both in both ions and water in both fishes. Um, in the uh, fish as well through the skin, in the freshwater fish you have water that can be absorbed into the skin and salts will be expelled out of the skin but in the marine organism the water is expelled out through the skin and uh, ions diffuse through the skin. And then in the gills, uh, you have water moving into the freshwater fish, ions moving out. And then you, in the marine fish, you have ions moving in and water moving out through the gills. And then in the freshwater fish, you're taking food in through the oral cavity. And in the marine fish, you take in salt water, which is both water and ions, and food in through the oral cavity. So these are ways that uh, f fishes can uh, osmoregulate in their marine environment. So osmoregulation, you could be a stenohaline 
which is also uh, when you're an organism, you're restricted to either that salt or freshwater environment, and you cannot survive in water with different salt concentrations. So um, they are specifically adapted to that particular environment. So if you're a freshwater fish, you are adapted. You're a uh, stenohaline, you are adapted to that environment. And if you were to take that fish and put it into a marine environment, that fish is not adapted to that environment and therefore it would die. Um, a urohaline organism uh, has a tremendous ability to effectively osmoregulate across broad ranges of salinities. And perfect examples of this would be organisms that live in uh, estuaries. And an estuary is a brackish water environment where you have an influx of both fresh water from land and you have the impact of uh, ocean currents coming in. So you get that uh, broad range of salinities. If you have a lot of rain on land, then the salt salinity of that water environment would decrease and it'd be more like fresh water. Or if you have a, a storm coming up the coast and it increases wave activity, uh, that would push the Atlantic Ocean for say into uh, the Chesapeake Bay, which is an estuary, and therefore salinity would increase as you have that influx of salt water into there. So these organisms that live in estuarine environments would have to be able to adapt to these fluctuations in salinity. So they would be your haline organisms. Haline or halo, like the halogens or uh, halophilic bacteria, that means salt. Another type of adaptation uh, that marine organisms need to deal with is temperature. So organisms lose heat more quickly in water than they do in air. So there are different types of uh, ways to deal with this. An organism that is an ectotherm or uh, poikilotherm, uh, basically what these organisms do is they can regulate internal body temperature by uh, having it vary with that of the ambient environmental temperature. So it's depending on the environmental heat sources and they have relatively low metabolic rates. And what we see here is, uh, that should say rates there, let me quick change that. What we see is uh, ectothermic organisms are best represented by fishes and reptiles. So you know that the, in, in cold environmental conditions, a lizard would become very lethargic or a snake would become very lethargic until its body heats up. So that's why they do sunbathing. And here you could see a what would be a, a lizard there sunbathing on the rock. So you have conduction of heat from the lizard, you have conduction of heat from the rock there, um, you have uh, convection, you have reflected radiation, directed solar radiation all coming in, evaporation, that would help regulate that uh, ectothermic organism's body temperature around that of the ambient air temperature. Then you have organisms that are endotherms, and you could see that here, uh, endotherms would be some fishes, such as the yellowfin tuna here pictured, and the great white shark. Um, endothermic organisms, basically their internal body temperature varies, but is elevated above the ambient environmental temperatures. And as a result, you have a, a metabolic heat reproduction that helps to keep it above the ambient environmental temperatures. And this is seen in some fishes. And then you have those organisms that are homeotherms, and their internal body temperature remains relatively constant despite the ambient environmental temperature. And this is seen in both birds and mammals. For example, humans, our uh, homeothermic temperature, internal body temperature is that of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, it's a, that stable constant temperature. And here we could see the polar bears as mammals and emperor peg, penguins. Uh, another type of uh, adaptation that marine organisms or, or water or organisms that live in an aquatic environment need to deal with is viscosity. And viscosity describes a fluid's internal resistance to flow. And we typically say that water has that thin um, uh, viscosity, that lower viscosity where honey has a thicker or higher viscosity. Um, basically viscosity describes the, the, the fluid's internal resistance to resist flow. And when you have that, that's called drag. And drag refers to the force that opposes the relative motion of an object through a fluid. And if you recall from physical science, a fluid, um, a substance that has uh, uh, the ability to flow, can be that of a gas or a liquid. Well, of course, since we're talking about an aquatic environment here, that would be the liquid. 
So you need to deal with some hydrodynamic adaptations, and some of them will be having a fusiform body shape. And a fusiform body shape is characterized by having both tapered ends, both at the head and the tail, as seen in fishes. So the head tapers off, the tail tapers off, making it more streamlined to travel through a, a liquid environment. Um, fish also secrete mucus from glands under their skin, which helps reduce drag by 60%. If you're a shark and we do the shark dissection, we'll see that sharks have dermal denticles on their skin. And the dermal denticles causes the water to form a thin film. And that thin film will help the organism reduce drag. Another type of environmental uh, stress that an organism needs to adapt to is hydrostatic pressure. And the pressure at a given depth in a static liquid is the result of the weight of the liquid acting on the unit area at that depth plus any pressure acting on the surface of the liquid. So we know that as far as pressure in a marine environment, pressure increases one atmosphere or one bar for every 10 meter depth of ocean water. So if you look at the surface of the water, zero meters, you are at a pressure of one bar or one atmosphere. And then if you go down 10 meters, you're at two, 20 meters, three, 30 meters, four, so on and so forth. So adaptations for pressure, organisms deal with this by having light skeletons and watery muscles. Um, they're fluid-filled body cavities rather than gas-filled body cavities and spaces. And a pisophile or a pisophilic organism is an organism that would thrive at high pressures. Um, this is typical of deep sea bacteria. So here you could see uh, bioluminescent deep sea bacteria, and you can see archaean bacteria over here. Um, living on the hydrothermal vents, these would be the ones that would carry out chemosynthesis there and convert that hydrogen sulfide gas, those inorganic materials, into organic substance for life in the deep ocean. Uh, buoyancy is the last thing that you need to adapt to, and buoyancy is the upward force caused by fluid pressure that keeps things afloat. Um, Archimedes' principle is the... Uh, the statement that any object wholly or partially immersed in a fluid is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So Archimedes' principle describes buoyancy and the adaptations there for organisms, marine organisms or aquatic organisms to deal with buoyancy is to have small size reducing sinking that would be seen in plankton, which are surface dwelling organisms that drift with currents um, if you're a shark, you'll have fins and hydrofoils that you'll use for buoyancy. Um, if you're plankton and sharks or other fishes, you'll have low-density organic compounds or oils or, or body fluids. And for bony fish, osteoichthys, um, you're going to have uh, gas-filled bladders, swim bladders, they're called. So we'll look at this when we do some of our dissections. And that's it for animals and organisms and adaptations within a marine environment.